Well, my name is Austin. I'm the lead pastor here at Tekoa. If we have not met, um, I would love to meet you um, soon. Um, and we are here in a series looking at the words of Jesus, the actions of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus. What did he say? What did he do? Who is Jesus? And we've been looking and spending time in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the most famous sermon of Jesus. It takes up three chapters in Matthew's Gospel. Um, and it has a lot to say about how God calls us to live. But I don't want to get, I don't want us to get so caught up in all the things that we have to do for God without missing that what Jesus actually has for us is good news for us. Sometimes we can just hear like, oh, I need to do another thing. Or Jesus wants me to live this way. God wants me to live this way. And it's true, but it's not just commandments for us. It's not burdensome for us. God actually has good news for us this morning. That's what the gospel literally means. The gospel means the good news of Jesus. And we're talking about the good news of Jesus, what he has for us. And he ends the sermon. We started backwards. We started with how he, Jesus ends the sermon. He start, ends it talking about how if you pay attention and live your life according to the ways he's directed, that when the storms of life come, and they will because this is, this is life, right? Life storms come. He says if you live the way he calls you to live, then you don't have to worry about the storms because your foundation will be secure, your house will be secure, your life will be secure in him and what he has for you. So my message today is called the good news of purpose. The good news of purpose. We're all looking for it. We're all looking for purpose. Sometimes we don't think about it, but there is a desire for purpose. And the good news of Jesus today for us is that he has purpose for us, right? We're, we're all looking for it. My, my four-year-old daughter even would just say, why? And then she'll ask me again, why? Right? If you've been around kids, even if you don't have kids, if you've been around little kids, you know their favorite question is why. Why do I have two eyes if I only see one thing? Why can't I see my eyes? Right? She's just getting me ready. Like, I'm already a pastor. I'm ready for the big questions of, you know, like, why are we here when we're out to lunch? We love going to get good food together because Hannah and I like certain things that um, my wife doesn't like, so we love to go out for pizza or an In-N-Out burger. And I know, she's going to ask me, like, why are we here? And I'm like, we're here to have lunch. She's going to be like, no, 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 why are we here on this earth? And that's what I'm talking about today. Why are we here? And that's literally why I felt called by God to start this church, because I was looking for purpose as I, I worked in sales and I um, wasn't working as a pastor in the church, which, right, all of you are not working as a pastor in a church right now. And so I was looking, what is my purpose? And we started this church to help people connect to God so that they could find and live out their purpose, not just on Sundays, we're going to talk some about that today, but your purpose, Monday through Saturday, with your family, with your friends, at school, at work. What has God created you to do? Why are you here on this earth? How does your life matter? How does it make a difference? So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can open there, a phone. It'll be on the screen, but it doesn't stay up there too long. So I invite you to follow along with us. Starting in verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now these two verses are going to connect to where we're going to spend most of our time today. And it's a connection to the Beatitudes of what Jesus has talked about, what we talked about last week, right? Last week we talked about, blessed are you when you're persecuted. And most caller, scholars will see this as a transition because it kind of goes with what Jesus just talked about, blessed are, and it kind of goes with what's about to come as he describes in depth, in more detail, what it's like to follow Jesus, what it's like to be a part of his kingdom. And if you're the light of the world, which is what we're going to talk about today, you will be persecuted. We talked about that last week. We're not called as followers of Jesus to retreat from the world, but to, be, to engage with it, to be peacemakers in it, to bring God's kingdom to this world. And it's worth it when we follow him. And one of the things that it's going to do, and we're going to talk about it today, is it's going to give us purpose. God created us for a reason, and he's got a purpose for you, for your life today. Well, before we get there, I think this is an interesting thing to talk about because we don't maybe talk about this, I think, enough in the church. It says, right, if you're following him, great will be your reward in heaven. Do you know you get rewards in heaven? Like, it sounds like, like, I feel like 
guilty saying that or like believing that. Like God already did so much for me. We just sang about, right, that, that we got brought out of the grave. He brought us out of our sin. Like it's already, the good news of Jesus is already too good to be true. You're telling me that there's also rewards in heaven. And there is, right? Your entrance to heaven is guaranteed through Jesus. What your rewards are in heaven are not guaranteed. That's based on what your life is here. And either way, it's going to be good. But I don't want to scrape by and try to get the most out of this life and just barely make it into heaven by like the narrowest of margins, right? Don't give up the best of heaven for the scraps under the table now. When we follow him and give our life completely to him, he's got good for us. He's got great for us in heaven, and he's got great for us here in this world and this earth as well. And the good news is we're all looking for purpose, and he's got a purpose for you. So in verse 13, he goes on to say, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. If you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Right? You put a light on a stand. Like, we don't put these just on the floor, right, to just, you know, do what they can. Like, we put them up on a stand so that as much light as possible so that you can see what you need to see during service here in your house, right? You don't have a light, like, and the baseboard around the bottom of your house, right? They're in the ceiling so that you can see what's going on. In the same way, God created us to be a light in the world, and we are supposed to shine that light to the world. He says, let me back up because I kind of started with the end there, but he says, we are the salt of the earth. What is salt? It's seasons. It preserves. It can promote healing. And the enemy is working to bring decay in our world. We are supposed to be a part of what God is doing in the world, the salt of the earth, to be preserving the world with the power of Jesus. Jesus, as he's sharing this, is near the saltiest place in the world, the Dead Sea. I went to the Dead Sea a while ago in Israel. It is ten times saltier than the ocean. That's kind of crazy. It if you didn't know this, salt makes you float. If you didn't know this, which you probably didn't, your pastor doesn't float in normal water. He sinks. I, I mean, I don't, not to the bottom, but my head doesn't go above the water. Dead Sea, only place in the world I've ever like floated easily. The other thing that happened when I was in the Dead Sea is I had a really bad cut on my leg from like exploring, you know, Israel. Like I, I want to say it was like me, like cool Tomb Raider style, like going through the ruins of Israel. And I think it was just like I tripped on the trail and like got my knee really hurt. But I was really scared. Do I go into the water? Like it's probably going to hurt, right? If you ever got salt in a wound, it hurts. And it did. It really, really hurt for like the first 90 seconds. But then the, the craziest thing was like by the time I woke up the next morning, my cut was like I've never had something heal so quickly. And that's what salt can do, right? It can bring healing because it purifies. It takes away anything that like the bacteria and whatever else can't grow in the salt. So it kills it all and your body can do the healing that it needs to do. Salt can bring healing as well. Salt is meant to enhance the flavor of food. It is not meant to be the flavor of food. Like sometimes I forget that. I do like the taste of salt a little bit. But it's meant to enhance the flavor of food. Did you know, like, if you add salt, I learned this recently, at various times during the cooking process, like, it layers into the food that you're eating. Like, if you just add it at the end, there's salt on the top. If you just add it at the beginning, there's salt, like, really deep in the dish. But if you add it as you cook, it actually brings layers to it. It enhances the food that you eat. We are supposed to enhance what God's doing here in this world. We're supposed to bring restoration to this world. And salt, light, and if salt isn't salty, it's pretty worthless, right? Like, and we might think, like, how is that possible, right? Na something, I don't know, I looked it up and then didn't write it down this week. But like, the sodium is a thing on the periodic table, like, how can it not be salty? Like, that's literally what it is. But in the Dead Sea, where they would gather a bunch of their salt and export it to a bunch of the world even, um, as they got the salt, it wasn't pure salt back in the day. 
There was other minerals and things that were mixed in with it. And if they weren't careful, the, uh, the salt part of it would leach out of what they had, and they'd be left with a bunch of minerals and other parts of rocks and different things, and it was worthless. It wouldn't preserve the food. It wouldn't enhance the flavor of the food. It wouldn't do anything. It was worthless. And Jesus is saying, you're the salt of this earth. You're supposed to actually be the salt and actually doing something. If it's lose, lost its saltiness, it's worthless. Have you lost the saltiness in your life? Not like the old person, I'm angry at the world, salty. Not that kind of salty. Like we're the preserving, we're bringing healing, we're bringing life to the world kind of saltiness in our life. We preach a gospel of repentance, a gospel of turning. Repentance is turning and living a different way for Jesus. That's what Jesus tells us to do. We preach as Jesus goes on in his sermon, a gospel that says living like the world is not the way of following Jesus and following God. We're supposed to live a different way. That's what being the salt. We're supposed to be the light. We don't change the light to look like the world. The light is God. The light is Jesus. That's how it is. We don't water it down. We don't say, let's make it less salty. We don't dim the light and say, well, if we dim the light, if we put a nice cover over the light, we can change it and make it more appealing to the world. Now, as we follow Jesus, Jesus is the one that changes people, and his light brings healing, it brings repentance, it brings restored relationship, it brings peace. We don't lessen it, we stand strong for it, we proclaim Jesus as a church. What we do, though, is we make, and I think this is what he's saying with the city on a hill, we should make the packaging attractive. We should make it easy for people to come to the light of Jesus. As we shine his light to this world, we're supposed to make it easy for them to approach Jesus. As we build a city on a hill, we're not supposed to build walls around the city that are difficult for people to come to Jesus. We're supposed to make the road smooth, and we're supposed to usher people in to Jesus. That's what we try to do as a church, right? And a city on a hill cannot be hidden, right? If it's up there and you're walking around, you can see that the city is up there. The world will know of the city, The world will know of the church. The world will know of you and how your life is as they follow Jesus. When most people who don't follow Jesus talk about what it looks like to follow Jesus or what Jesus believes or does or says, what they say is what they've seen another Christian in their life do. Right? That's what the world sees. They will see the city on the hill. And a city, like I, is easily defensible. Right? A city on a hill. That's partly why you put it there. It also can be a beacon. But we're not supposed to, as a church or as a Christian, put big walls around the city to defend the city. We're supposed to usher people in. We're supposed to be like a lighthouse to our world, to make it encouraging, attractive, easy, and and help people on their journey to Jesus. He's the one that saves. And he challenges us, though, to live differently. We don't water that down. We don't dim the light. Jesus is the light of the world, and he makes us lights as well. And you can't be the light of the world and hide your light. Is your light shining? Do people know you are a Christian at work, at school, in your family? Do they know? Can they see Jesus through you? Are you being salt? Are you being light? Do your neighbors know that you are a Christian? Do your classmates know? This is more than we just do on Sundays It's how each of us are supposed to live and represent Jesus, but I want to look at our church for a minute because I think it's a good example. It's why we literally try to make it easy for people to come to church with signs outside, right? It's why we have coffee and donuts. It's why we have people greeting out front to make it welcoming for people to come in so that they can encounter God and be transformed by Him. It's why we have the music that we do. It's why we intentionally are downtown because this place place downtown needs a church it's why we pray about all of those things it's why we seek and try to grow better at all of those things because we want to help people as we build god's city get connected to him because it leads people to the foot of the cross and the cross is what changes people we want to make it approachable i try to make my messages right approachable so that people can encounter god because he's the one that will change their lives When we preach the gospel, we don't change that. That's why I challenge you in your faith. And the gospel is challenging, and that's okay. It's not meant to be comfortable. 
That's why we have a responsibility. We have a response. Sometimes we even have response times in church, and it might be, feel a little weird if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe it feels a little awkward and you are a follower of Jesus. Do I really, like, respond in front of everybody? They can see me. But in that, God is at work. God is moving. And as a church, we want to help you do that. We're going to have an opportunity even this, this fall as a, to come around um, hundreds of other churches in the Bay Area. We're going to come together, um, and we're all going to be talking about the same thing at the same time together. And it's going to be great as we link arms together. And part of that is going to be to give you some tools to help you be a light in the world. And I'm giving you a little teaser now, but don't just be like, okay, well, I'm good. Pastor said it's coming in the fall, like I'm good now. Now, how are you being salt? How are you being net light right now in your life? How are you even just encouraging those around you? How are you building relationships with your coworkers? How are you getting to know your neighbors so that when the time is right, that they'll respond to the invite that you've given 10 other times, but they finally say yes to the question that you asked? finally said yes to come to church, or they finally said yes to come to your small group, or they finally said yes to just getting coffee with you and talking about life, right? How are you building those relationships? How are you building those pathways? And I think people in life are looking for three things. This isn't just me. I think they, like, they've done studies on this. People are looking, all people basically are looking for three things in life. They're looking for a, like, a group, a place to belong to, they're looking for deep relationship and connection, people that they can do life with, and they are looking for their purpose. Why are they here? What is the meaning of life? Like, what do I do with my life? I want, to, I want my life to matter, right? I get, uh, you know, hopefully 80 plus years on this world, but that's all I get. I want it to matter and not just fade to dust again. They're looking. We say it around here, like there's a big sign in the lobby, find your people, find your place, find your purpose. So those three things, what all of us are looking for, even outside the walls of the church, everybody's looking for those things. Their people, their place, their purpose. That's why I think this passage is good news for us today, because even though it doesn't use the word purpose at all, Jesus is getting at what is our purpose here. Our purpose is to be the light of the world. Our purpose is to be the salt of the earth. And when we actually live it out, it's good news because it's what our souls are desiring to do. And when we get to do it, it's a good thing for us because that's what we all want to do. It's good news for us today. We're all looking for purpose. I was lost. I was looking for purpose. And, um, and I was sharing, you know, when I was in a sales job, like I knew Jesus, but I didn't know purpose in my life. And that's why our mission is to connect people to God so they can find and live out their purpose. And part of this goes back to when I was in high school, and I'm not going to share the whole story today. I've shared some of it before, but for time, but when I was, you know, a freshman in high school, I did a huge project at my church so that I could become an Eagle Scout. And it was this huge project to build a playground and raise a bunch of finances and, and do all these things for the community and for our church. And what I want to focus on today is what I learned through that project. It was crazy. You know, hundreds of volunteers, thousands of dollars, hours and hours and hours of not just me, but other people that went into that. And what I, what it opened my eyes to was people were so excited to help. People were so excited to give. And I was so excited to do that. I saw, you know, parents sacrifice hard work, nights, weekends to make it happen. I saw kids literally save up their summer savings and give to it because they wanted to help other kids and be so excited about doing that. I, had ch I saw a church unite for something that would make a difference, and it did. It was a safe, fun place for the church to utilize for ministry. It was a safe, fun place that the church could do outreach and invite the community into for kids in the community to get to use, and I got to see that. It was worth it, and it forever changed me and I, I felt like I couldn't live a normal life anymore after that. I knew what it was like to literally build a city on a hill and be a part of what God was building. It was intoxicating in some ways. How could I go and do anything else with my life than help other people get connected to God and help make a difference in this world with God? To build that a city. And what I learned in that, even more than just building it myself, to equip others to do it. There was something remarkable how helping somebody else find their purpose and helping them live it out and getting to see that and be a part of it and 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 be a part of their journey as well 
The disciples all left businesses to follow Jesus. Following God is all of our calling. You probably don't need to give up your business or your job or any of that to follow Jesus. But you will need to change your life to follow him. We need to live differently. Our lives will look differently if we're following him. What you get in return is salvation. What you get in return is a relationship with Jesus. And what you get in turn is to live a life of purpose that makes a difference. You get to be a part of what God is doing, what Jesus is doing to save the world. You get to literally be a part of changing lives. You get to be used by God to bring healing. You get to be used by God to bring hope to the hopeless. This is what it means to follow God, to be a part of your calling. It's the best thing you could ever do with your life. To be used by God to restore relationships and marriages and family. And it can require sacrifice. Being a Christian might mean that you get persecuted at times. We talked about that last week. Being a part of a startup church that meets in downtown, that sets up and tears down every Sunday, right? Sometimes there's difficulty that goes with that. But it's good news because you get to be a part of what God is doing in our city. You get to be a part of him bringing his kingdom to this world. And here's the key for us this morning. You have to keep one eye on the light of Jesus and one eye on the lost in our world. That's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. One eye on the light and one eye on the lost, those that God is making a difference in their lives. And it it helps as well to be a part of some other Christians that are walking alongside you in the way, but keep one eye on the light and one eye on the lost. I was supposed to take a picture this morning. I didn't take a picture. I was supposed to take a picture yesterday and I forgot to do that. I was supposed to take it this morning. That's why it's just black up there. There's not even the T up there. This is totally black. I totally forgot. And the picture I was going to take, I was going to use Tim because Tim is my favorite person to use and he's a good sport about it. But I was going to take a picture like really close to the coffee cup with Tim in the background. And in that picture, you know what's going to happen is the coffee cup is going to look five times the size of Pastor Tim. Because it's right here. It's like if I hold it right here, it, it looks, all I see is a giant T, right? That's all I see. And it matters what our perspective is. It matters where we are. It matters what we're close to. Because what you're close to looks gigantic. And if you're close to God, then he's the biggest thing in your life. And he looks big. Because he is big. And the size of God does not change. He is always all-powerful. He is always more than enough. He is always great enough for you in your life. But if you get too far away from him and your eye comes off of him and it comes to the thing that is right in front of you, maybe it's your fear, maybe it's your anxiety, maybe it's the thing that you're hoping for, maybe it's the thing that you're worried about, and that thing gets so big in front of your face that you lose sight of God and he looks so small and he looks so far away. You're so distracted by the persecution, you're so distracted by the thing that's right in front of you, but we need to keep our eye on God in the middle of it so that you can see him. The Bible tells us he's with us. He's with us. And he is here in this world building his kingdom. He's here in this house, his church, building it. He's with us when we go build his kingdom. And so the other is keep your eye on God. The other is keep your eye on the lost. Those are those who don't know Jesus. Those who God is ministering to. Maybe even they do know Jesus. And it's just those who God is ministering to in this world. Those that God is working. It's the reason for our lives. It's our purpose. We're to be a part of what God is doing in their lives. God is using us. He has chosen us to bring his message. He has chosen us to be the salt of the earth. He's chosen us to be the light of the world, and we're supposed to be a part of that. Right? That's where he is. As John 3.16 says, he loved the world so much he sent his one and only son to go and save it. That's where God is. He's saving the world. If you want to know where he's at, that's where he's at. He's saving the world. That's where God is located. He's moving. He's with us. He's moving. If you want to know where he is, he's saving the world. To build a city on the hill that will usher people into his presence and be the light of the world. So keep an eye on God. Keep an eye on the lost. And if you do that, you will begin to live out your purpose. You will find it if you don't know it yet. You will be a part of building God's kingdom. 2023 has been rough for me just on a personal level. It's been a challenging year. It was worse 
2020 was surprisingly not that bad for me, and I think I just like skated through some of COVID. It wasn't as bad as it, it was for some people, and I was like, I didn't get out of it. God was just saving it for 2023 for me. And you know what? Two weeks ago, it was Saturday night, and it was 9 p.m., and I got a phone call from here saying, you can't meet here the next morning. You can't get any of your stuff because there was a fire in the building, and you, 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 like the fire department won't let anybody in. I was like, okay. And on, on top of a rough 2023, so that happened, like last weekend was a challenging week of ministry in our service here, and it was just challenging, and I went home, and I was just tired. And I went home, and I started to think, though. I said, you know what? God, I'm so grateful because I have what I've always dreamed of. I'm living a life of purpose. I have what I always wanted. I'm living a life of purpose. I'm thankful to God that I learned the lesson I needed to learn. I'm thick-headed, so I had to learn it the hard way, and I wish I would have learned it the easy way. But I learned this lesson a long time ago. That, that I needed, when I was searching for purpose, the lesson I needed to learn was, I thought I didn't have purpose because I had a calling to work in full-time ministry, and I wasn't working in full-time ministry. I was working in sales. It's like the complete opposite of full-time ministry, right? Like, I could do so much else to, like, help people do something in the world, but I was working there, and not where I thought I was supposed to be working. I was looking for purpose, and what I learned, what I needed to learn in that moment, in that time that unfortunately wasn't a moment, it was three years of my life, was that God didn't need me. He's at work in this world. He doesn't need me. I thought I had given up my career and the money of like being an engineer and doing all these things, and I moved across the country multiple times, and I did missions in difficult places around the world, and I got here, and I got to this point, and I said, God, I followed you, I followed you, I followed you, and I said, God, now I deserve something in return. Like, right now it's time for the payday of, like, this. Like, I know it's not going to be the same payday as if I was an engineer, but, like, it's time for what I deserve, God. And he said, no, 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 no. You don't deserve anything. But what I needed to learn was the good news out of that. God's no wasn't, wasn't bad for me. God's no wasn't angry at me. It was a loving no so that I could learn what I needed to learn. That he doesn't owe me anything. God doesn't owe you anything. But he has chosen to include you if you accept it and if you choose to work with him. God is going to use you to bring salvation to San Jose. He's going to use you to bring life to your friends, to your family, to your coworkers, to your classmates. He wants to use you and he wants to be a part. He wants you to be a part of what he is doing, right? What he is doing is he desire, desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy. And that's the truth. Because then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The laborers are few. God's not stopping his work. The harvest is happening either way. The question is, are you a part of what he's doing to bring that harvest? He wants you. He wants to give you a purpose. He wants to give your life meaning. And for the few years on this, that you have on this earth to matter, to make a difference with your life. Last week I was tired, and it was Tuesday, and I had things that I had been worrying about, and I was praying about, and I got to connect with another pastor in our city, and I thought, I was reminded of what I was talking about, that I learned that lesson the hard way, and I thought, you know what? I'm not sad. I'm really encouraged. Why? Because God is moving. Why? Because God is at work. Because I get to be a part of that every single week at our church. It happens on Sundays. It happens at groups during the week. It happens when I grab coffee with somebody from our church. It's amazing. It's incredible, and I'm helping other people do the same thing. And I'm so lucky that this is my job and my calling, and you get to be a part of it too, to build this church with your attendance, to be a part of our team, as a part of giving, as a part of inviting, as a part of serving our city and loving our city. When you do that, you get to be a part of being a light on a hill, building a city on a hill that people can know Jesus. You get to be part of being the salt of the earth. When you're a light in your neighborhood, when you're a light at work, when we go serve the homeless, you get to be a part of that too, what God is doing. And I was talking to my friend, and I was like, you know what, it's been difficult, but actually it's been amazing. I said, you know what, two weeks ago, we got to meet in the park, and it was incredible. The sun was shining. It was beautiful. Our team got an easy week with set up and tear down for the week. It was fun. We got to connect and families got to connect. We got to have some discussion time. I got to see people I don't normally see. And you know what? That was amazing. I'm so glad that God did what he did and I got to be a part of it. 
I said, you know what, last week was difficult, but you know what, I got to pray for four different families at the end of our service. And it was a privilege that I get to do that. And that privilege that our prayer team gets to pray in the morning. And, you know, if you want to be a part of that specific thing, you can be a part of our prayer team as well. But even if you're not part of the prayer team, if you're a part of this church, you're a part of facilitating what God is doing in those people's lives. I said, you know what, it's, it's incredible. A year ago, if I would have invited people to something like that, if we were, well, not lucky, but if God was moving like one person, would have come for that. But God has been building a culture of response, of just heartfelt desire to seek Him. And so there were so many people that I ran out of time last week to pray, and so I had to pray for people after the service ended. And I was so grateful for to be a part of that. I'm so grateful that our church is here, and you are a part of being a part of those stories of what God is doing. It's incredible. I'm so grateful to be a part of it, because God doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But man, is it a good thing to be a part of him building his kingdom in this world. And we need to keep an eye on him and what he's doing. Keep an eye on the lost. And then we can have that right perspective. That is good. If God has given us, why has God given us two eyes? If we only see with, you know, one vision? Because he has given us two eyes to see this world so that we can see what he's doing. To keep one on him, to keep one on this world. And God is reaching this city. He's reaching San Jose. He wants to give you purpose. He wants to use you. It doesn't matter your background. I love the church that God is building. It doesn't matter your background. God is using Apple engineers. He's using former pastors. He's using those that are retired, those that are students. He's using former drug addicts. He's re- using recovering addicts. He's using those that were in prison. He's using men. He's using women. He's using people from every background to build his church, to build his kingdom. It doesn't matter if you think you're smart or not. It doesn't matter if you think you've done too much in your past or you have too much sin in your life, right? It doesn't matter. What matters is Christ in you. That's what matters. That's our testimony. Our testimony is just our story of what it's meant to follow Jesus. I talked about that in the park two weeks ago, to just share our testimony, share our story. Like, that's how we build the path through the city that leads people to the light that is Jesus. We just say, you know what? This is the path I'm on. It's been a good path as I follow Jesus. I, I don't, just come with me. Just come, come after me. That's what it means to help be a light to our world. This is to share the goodness of what God is doing. It's amazing. And if you're a part of what God is doing, He's going to give you purpose. He is using you to build His kingdom. And He's going to fulfill the deepest desires of your life to find your people, to find your place, to find your purpose, to make a difference. And this is the gospel. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The old, the new has come. Right? It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter your sin. It doesn't matter your mistakes. It doesn't matter that, you know, you've been following Jesus for two days or 20 years. It doesn't matter. You are a new creation in him. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is... In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their sins against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God wanted to restore our relationship to him. Our sin was blocking the way, but so he sent Jesus who was perfect who could become our righteousness, one who could restore our relationship with God, and then he sends us out as ambassadors. It's another, right? That's, this is Paul's way of saying, you're the light of the world. Go. Be an ambassador for Jesus to this world. Be a part of sharing with others how good God is, what it means to follow him. This is what it means. And all of us, if we are followers of Jesus, have that call. All of us, that's our purpose in this life. And the good news is, it's amazing to live that out. Because God created us to live a life that matters, a life of meaning, and we're all desiring it. And sometimes it seems like work, but once we do it and are a part of it, it's an incredible thing to be a part of what God is doing in this world. So I want to pray for us. Would you pray with me? Hmm. I just want to start, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, if you have not been reconciled to God, you haven't taken that first step, 
We say, that sounds good. I want a life of purpose. I want a life of meaning. I want to find my people. I want to find my place. I want to be connected to God. He says, just trust in me. Through the work of Jesus, you'll be reconciled. Jesus was perfect where we couldn't be perfect. If that's you, just echo these words with me. God, I believe I'm not perfect. I believe I sinned. Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose again. And Jesus, I choose to follow you. God, I thank you, Lord, for all of us, whether we just made that decision right now or we've been following you for years, that we are a new creation in you. And so, God, I pray that you would give us purpose, not our purpose, but your purpose, God. I pray that you would use us to build our city, to just be the salt, to bring restoration, to bring healing, to bring life to our city, that you would use us. God, help me keep one eye on you, one eye on the lost. God, I commit to be your light to this city. God, use us to be your light. Use this church to be a light in this city, to be changing people. Lord, I thank you that you've been doing it already. God, I pray that you would do more. You would use this church to be a light on a hill that makes it easy for people to come and approach you, Jesus, and get connected to you, God. Would you move? Would you change the nations, God, through us? Amen.